Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Trauma-Informed Approach to Self-Care for Educators and Other Child-Serving Professionals, Tips for the New Year, with Dr. Nikki Edge and Ms. Emily Robbins. Uh, my name is Anna Kate Bogards, and I'll be your webinar moderator for today. I'm also being joined by uh, Chad Sievers, who many of you know, um, who's going to help moderate today as well. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you know a little bit about the ARBEST and TRIS programs and do some housekeeping announcements. So Arkansas Building Effective Services for Trauma, or ARBEST, is a state-funded program at the UAMS Psychiatric Research Institute, and our aim is to improve mental health services for children and families who have experienced trauma. We work closely with many state partners uh, to build a more trauma-informed state, and we're probably best known for providing training to mental health professionals on treatments that are effective with helping children and families recover from trauma. The Arkansas Trauma Resource Initiative for Schools, or TRIS, is a collaboration between UAMS, which includes uh, some of us over at ARBEST, the Arkansas Department of Education and other key stakeholders and is funded by the Arkansas Blue and U Foundation. We provide training, consultation, mental health service navigation and other resources to school personnel of K through 12 schools in Arkansas to better recognize and respond to the impact of trauma on students, staff and the community. Um, and uh, Dr. Edge and Ms. Robbins will be telling you more about this exciting new initiative uh, later on in the presentation. So just, that's a little bit about us. Um, and so just to do a few housekeeping announcements before we start the presentation, uh, we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the course of today's webinar and to um, participate through the chat if you are prompted to do so. Um, both of these functions should be at the right side of your screen, so you can use the chat window or the question window to participate. Um, Chad will be monitoring that, and so we hope to get some interaction through that throughout the presentation, and um, we'll get to your questions at the appointed time. Um, a quick note about videos. So we have a few videos that are part of the presentation. If you are using the computer audio, to listen to today's webinar. You should be able to hear the videos. Um, however, if you're joining by telephone, you might have trouble uh, hearing them. If so, don't worry. Uh, we're including links to all of these videos in, in a handout that I will be sending to you all after the webinar. So don't worry too much about that. If you're interested in earning a CEU, <coughs> excuse me, just be sure to stick around to the very end and we'll provide you a code and I'll give you some more instructions at that point. We are recording this webinar, which we'll upload to the Arbest YouTube channel. And that's also a place you can check out some of our other previously recorded webinars. Finally, uh, don't forget to check us out, uh, check Arbest or Tris out on uh, Facebook and like us. Uh, that's where we frequently post webinars, training opportunities, and other resources. So that's a, a great place to stay in touch with us. Um, let's see here. So that's all of our housekeeping announcements. Um, I'm going to turn this presentation over to our presenters and let them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, this is Emily Robbins. I am an LCSW clinical social worker and I am the trauma care um, manager for the TRIS program. And so I'm very excited and I appreciate you all taking time um, to be here today, maybe on your lunch break, maybe this is your self care time and we appreciate you joining us for this hour and learning about self care and the importance of it. We would love to hear who you are, where you're from, the environment that you're working in. We had heard that there was going to be teachers, child care workers, um, school staff, maybe people from boys and girls clubs, after school programs. We would just love to hear in the chat over on the right side of your screen if you could tell us 
maybe where you're from and the role that you provide um, in uh, child care agencies. We would love to know more about who is joining us today. And also I can, um, you'll be seeing a poll come up and you can respond to that poll if you're able um, and we can kind of see what roles people play if you're part of a school setting. Just give that a few seconds while your responses come in. All right, so let's see here. Oh. Great, so it looks like uh, about a quarter of you are teachers, uh, another quarter are other school staff, and then 10% uh, counselors, and 42% uh, are other, non-related, so it's great. Okay, thank you all for participating in that and giving us some information about who you are. That's important to us. So I wanted to share um, a little bit more information about our trauma resource initiative uh, program, the TRIS program that we have started in the beginning of July of 2021. And I don't know, I can't see the slide there, Anna Kate. Do we have the slide back up for the PowerPoint? It might be because I was sharing the poll, but um, you should have it now. Can you see it? I still just see the poll outcome. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Let me see if I can close that. There we go. Thank you so much. Okay. The Trauma Resource Initiative was created to provide supports to school staff in response to adverse or traumatic events. We're working to do that with helping schools prepare, respond, and recover from those events. So when we think about the school community, we want to be sure to think about the big picture. So that includes students, teachers, support staff, administration, and even the parents of your school community. So today we're gonna to spend time talking about supporting the staff of your school or your childcare facility. Our objectives for today are that we would, one, better understand how does stress and trauma, how can it possibly impact, our, impact us both directly and indirectly? Second, why is self-care a component of a trauma-informed school? Third, explore some of those self-care strategies. And then fourth, we will provide you the resources to actually create your own self-care goal. And if we have time, we'll actually walk through that process with you to create these goals. Our team works a lot with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. They have created this framework for trauma-informed schools. Developing a trauma-informed school is a long-term journey with many focus areas, as you can see on the screen. Today, we are touching mainly on a few elements from two component areas, the trauma awareness and education and supports for staff wellness. These are two good places to start. Self-care and wellness in this situation is similar to how we are taught on a plane that if there's ever an emergency, we need to secure our own oxygen mask first and then care for those around us. So today we're gonna to talk about why is that so important? Our first objective was to better understand how stress and trauma can impact people directly and indirectly. As we start this conversation, I want to put it in a bit of context. We're gonna be talking about strategies that can help us through stressful times and even coping with more extreme circumstances. 
What we are going to talk about today are things that can be helpful wherever you think you or your school team is on this continuum from maybe stressed to having widespread experiences of trauma. Stress, we all know what stress is. It's a normal experience and a little bit of it can be healthy at times. Sometimes we are moving past stress and more into the crisis or feeling really distressed. This is when our experiences or circumstances are making it feel impossible to manage the situation well or cope in healthy ways. And we are starting to feel real emotional distress. And then there is when stress becomes really toxic and we call that trauma. The kind of threat to our well being that often leaves us with lasting impacts on our brain, our body, and even our behavior. We'll talk more about all of these, but the main point here is that wherever you all are on this continuum, from stressed to having widespread experiences of trauma, the strategies we are going to talk about today will be helpful. So let's start the discussion on the left-hand side with some basic concepts about stress. A simple definition of stress is mental and or emotional strain or tension. One way to think about stress is to imagine a rubber band that is being pulled apart by either hand. The elastic material can only stretch so far before it breaks. We all have personal and professional stressors. All parts of our life are pulling on that rubber band. Maybe worries about your children are pulling on that rubber band or financial stressors, whatever it is. As teachers and school staff, you may be going through things that cause stress before you even walk into your building. So there is what we bring into the workplace and then there are workplace contributors. There are several reasons why someone may feel stress in a work environment like a school. School staff may feel their levels of stress elevate when they feel unsafe or unsupported. Working with students can also lead to feelings of being overwhelmed emotionally. Some teachers and school staff may feel incompetent or ineffective, like they're not doing a good job. As people, we tend to focus on the criticism rather than on compliments, which can lead to increased negative thoughts or feelings about our work performance. Stress is worsened when school staff feel like their needs are not being met or their thoughts and opinions aren't heard or validated. And it makes me wonder, how has COVID and the pandemic increased feelings of stress in the school environment? So what does stress look like? Stress can show up in lots of different ways for people. Each person's stress response is unique to their experience, their history, and maybe even their culture. These are some of the common symptoms of stress. Stress indicators can be broken down into physical indicators, like changes in your eating habits, fluctuation in your weight, and that could be loss or gain of weight, fatigue or fogginess, changes in your sleeping patterns, maybe you're sleeping more or sleeping less, and other body feelings like headaches and muscle tension. Think for a moment for yourself. When you feel stress, what part of your body do you feel it in? I know for me, it's my head and my neck and my shoulders. That's when I know I'm stopping for a moment and kind of thinking, what's going on? That's where I feel, often feel my stress. Stress may also take on the form of emotional or relational changes. High levels of stress can leave people feeling out of control or like they don't know who they are. They may express apathy or loss of interest in hobbies. They may struggle with getting tasks done or appear forgetful. There are a lot of different ways stress can present. And what is really important is to be aware of changes over time. It is also important that many of these stress indicators can look like depression. 
and more generalized anxiety. That is why it is important to be checking in with yourself and your peers, your family members, and your loved ones. At this point in the pandemic, this may be your baseline functioning, and it can be hard to remember what was life like before all of this. We all have the tendency to want to avoid uncomfortable emotions or the fact that we might be struggling more than we'd like to acknowledge. For some of us, that can be difficult. On one hand, working in and around trauma can lead to high levels of compassion and satisfaction. Compassion and satisfaction is the pleasure and satisfying feeling that comes from helping others. On the other hand, there are several ways trauma can impact us and impact our workplace, even if we haven't personally experienced traumatic events that really disrupt our lives. And that's because it turns out that being a compassionate, helping professional working with people who've experienced trauma, it can take a toll on us especially if we are not very careful about how we are taking care of ourselves and our colleagues. Without supports in place, being a compassionate, helping professional working with survivors of trauma actually increases the risk for burnout and other negative effects. Burnout, loss of enthusiasm for work, not feeling a sense of accomplishment, irritability, not feeling better after a time off, worn down. One of the consequences of burnout can be high rates of teacher turnover. Does anyone have a guess about rates of teacher turnover in their first five years of teaching? And now we wanna share with you a video that was created to talk a little bit about teacher burnout. Burnout, the sustainability of a, of a teacher is very delicate. Education as a profession is basically the only social service that doesn't require, as part of its credentialing or ongoing credentialing process, some sort of way to process stress and trauma. Most police fire EMT agencies, if there is a death or a major traumatic event, they're at least required to do a couple hours of therapy to jump back on their, their rigs or get their gun and their badge back. Educators are expected to go for as long as 30 or 35 years, but absolutely nothing to help us process stress and trauma. And we hold a lot of vicarious trauma for the students and families that we serve. What's burnout? It's the ability to deal with stress. These are challenges of all We're dealing with all the forces at work in a public school. A lot of stress, anxiety, chaos. It's coming at them, a lot of energy coming at them every day. I think mindfulness gives us a force field that helps them take that in, but not let it affect them in a negative way. It helps them deal with it in a more healthy, patient manner. As we mentioned, these videos will we will be able to share the links with you in the handout. So if you um, were not able to hear all of the pieces, that will certainly be available to you um, after the presentation. So the last question that I asked you before we went into the video was, does anyone have a guess about rates of teacher turnover in the first five years of teaching? And what we learn in this video is that 42% of teachers 
they leave or there's turnover within the first five years. That's huge. And then these teachers themselves are talking about what it's like when they're experiencing difficult events in their schools and being able to have that. They use the words vicarious trauma and burnout, same words that we're using to talk about today. That's why we wanna get back into this self-care. So what can we do? How can we, how can we address these areas? And how can we support each other? So we already talked about burnout, but there are other impacts as well. Some people use the word vicarious trauma, like we heard in the video, or trauma exposure response to describe some of the other ways trauma can impact us. There was a first responder who put it this way. If you care with people with your heart wide open, you often don't realize how much of what you are exposed to is being taken in and held in your body. I thought I was fine until I got home and I had nightmares and headaches and it was and I was so irritable with my family. There's even a concept called compassion stress, where we so want to help someone who is suffering that it becomes hard when we cannot fix their pain. And then there is secondary traumatic stress, the impact of knowing about the trauma of others. In some parts of our society, we build elaborate defenses to keep the difficult stories of others out of our line of sight. And as we start to really see and hear what's going on around us, and it is embodied right in front of us, it can be very overwhelming. It goes beyond burnout. 30% of those who experience serious trauma will go on to develop symptoms of PTSD. Similar rates for secondary traumatic stress are found among staff who work around a great deal of trauma. Symptoms are similar or maybe even mimic PTSD. Thinking about the trauma when you don't want to, you may have nightmares or flashbacks. Avoid reminders of the trauma. You may feel anxious or have a change in your mood. This is when we take another person's trauma and we carry it into our own body. It's important for us to be aware of this. We need to check in with ourselves and with those in our workplace and just say, how are you doing? As we emerge from this pandemic or maybe endure this pandemic, we wanna ask ourselves, how am I different now than I was before? How are we different now than we were before? Be honest and have no judgment. All of these things are associated with poor job performance, irritability, staff turnover. And there are things we can do in our workplace to help. I like when we find the positives. Being trauma-informed requires a thoughtful approach to supporting staff wellness. So now we've identified the range of problems we hope to help prevent. And one of the ways we do that is through self-care. So let's dive into this topic. How are we going to support and help each other? What is the first word or phrase that comes to mind when I say self-care? Feel free to throw these in the chat or just think of them to yourself. I know sometimes I've heard the words being selfish. I don't have time. That's not a part of my job. I have to take care of others first. Or for maybe for some, it's my time. I look forward to it. Yes, whatever that is. Just thinking about what does self-care mean to you? Let's explore a few statements about self-care and what it is and what it's not. First, self-care is one of the components of a trauma-informed approach. Trauma can have an impact on children, families, schools, and communities. Any school educator who works with children with trauma histories is vulnerable to the effects of trauma, like secondary traumatic stress. It is not uncommon to feel physically, mentally, and emotionally worn out. Or in other words, experience compassion fatigue and burnout. The best way to respond to these experiences is early recognition and addressing your needs through self-care practices. It is also important to emphasize self-care supports a state of overall physical, 
mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Sometimes we think of self-care as a one-time event. I'm gonna go get a pedicure this one time and it'll make it all better. But it's important to remember that self-care needs to be an ongoing practice that allows you to maintain effectiveness at work. This is not a one and done type of thing. We can think of it like any other routine that we put in place, maybe our morning routine that we need in order to get out of the house, or maybe the gym routine that makes sure you get there every day or whenever your scheduled gym day is. A good self-care routine can help sustain a positive attitude despite challenges and experience your right to feeling well, safe, and fulfilled, because that is your right. So again, what we want to do is engage in prevention. We want to aim for, what we want to aim for is what one author describes as trauma stewardship. This is enhancing our ability to bear witness to trauma and stories of without sacrificing our ability to live fully. To understanding we are affected by the suffering of others. The world will look and feel different to us the more we are exposed to the trauma of others. It's kind of like the painter in this cartoon on the slide. Painters get pain on them in the course of a day's work. Human service professionals who work with trauma, you get trauma on you too. We have to find ways to be honest about how we are doing and find ways to work that is sustainable. When we do that, we prevent not just that secondary traumatic stress, but burnout, compassion fatigue, and all the other labels we give to the distress our workforce is feeling. There are a few concepts that will be important as we move forward in our self-care journey. The first concept is resilience. I love this word. Resilience is the ability for an individual to bounce back after going through something traumatic or working closely with someone who has. We all have different propensities for resilience, which is a combination of our genetics and our environment. When we think about building resilience, we know there are things we can do to help ourselves and others to bounce back. As we try to be resilient against stress and trauma, we sometimes think about a scale. It's important to keep in mind our protective factors versus our risk factors. We think of risk factors as something that is pulling us or the students we work with down. It could be things like everyday stresses, our own history of trauma, working with children with experiences of trauma. And then on the other side, protective factors, are the things we have that pull us up. These are the people, places, and things that mean the most to us and make us feel good, even on a bad day. For students, this could be a sports team or a social group. For adults, it can mean a great deal of things. So let's talk about how we can beef up that healthy side of the scale. How many of you make sure your phone is always charged throughout the day? Some of us even carry those little charging blocks in the vent that we're not near a plug. We still know there is a backup charge for our phone or iPads. So back to that example about putting on your oxygen mask first. The reason why self-care is so important is the same reason when you were on a plane, they tell us to make sure in case of emergency, you secure your your mask first before assisting others. If you don't have emotional resources left over, it will be hard to help anyone else in need. If there is only one takeaway I want of all of you to have from this part of the training, it is that self-care is not being selfish. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Edge. Hi everybody, I'm Nikki Edge. And I have the good fortune of getting to work with Emily and Chad and Anna Kate and others on the TRIST team. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper now that Emily has provided this great kind of background for us 
and I'm going to um, talk about what self care really looks like. And as we look at that, as we think about building our resilience, building our protective factors, and doing that through self care, we're going to use the ABC framework. This is a common framework. You may have seen this before. Um, so we we think about these um, three components awareness, balance, and connection. And they're shown here visually the way that they are as overlapping because they do overlap. They're, they are um, interrelated, um, not always completely distinct. So awareness um, is just the, the first step uh, in our sort of self-care journey. And that's just paying attention to how we're doing. And, and as Emily was um, describing earlier, not judging ourselves for that, but just noticing. Um, and that way we can take steps to, to address when we have greater needs. And then balance, the B. Um, balance is just looking to balance out the parts of our lives. Work with personal and family. Rest versus activity. Um, and then the different parts of ourselves, the intellectual side, the physical side, etc. And then connection. We know that social connection is one of the most powerful stress reducers. In fact, we have um, longitudinal studies now that tell us that social connection is actually um, prolongs our lives. It's that important to our overall well-being. So I want to spend the next few minutes kind of diving into each of these awareness, balance, and connection one by one. So awareness. So awareness can basically be boiled down to paying attention to ourselves, being present, tuning in, tuning into our thoughts, to our emotions, to our physical bodies. You know, we spend a lot of our time thinking about the past, what happened yesterday, what happened last school year, what happened in our childhood. And we spend a lot of time worrying about the future, um, especially right now in this middle of, you know, this in, never ending pandemic, like what is next week going to bring? Like, are we going to be in school? Are we going to be at home? Like, is my family going to get sick? There is a lot to be worried about. But awareness requires us to be present in now, in today, not in the past, not in the future. So slowing down, focusing inwardly, thinking about how we're feeling. You know, how does my body feel? What am I thinking? What are the thoughts that are going through my head? What are the things that I'm telling myself? What's my self-talk sounding like? What am I feeling? What are my emotions? Do I feel safe here? Do I feel comfortable here? You know, what's my current level of stress? How am I coping with it? When it comes to our self-care journey, the awareness part is really knowing you know, letting us know when we need to up our self-care game, right? So recognizing when we need to do more to take care of ourselves. Sometimes we're better at recognizing stress in others than ourselves. Like I can, you know, just have a text exchange, you know, with my daughter or with my partner and know that something is a little off. I just know from their tone that they're, that they're having a stressed day. But sometimes we aren't as good as recognizing it in ourselves. So, you know, just finding ways to become more aware of our thoughts and feelings can help us overcome that. We need to know our limitations and our needs. So we have to kind of make time and space for this. Um, you know, that maybe that means that, you know, as you sit down with your morning coffee, you take a minute to just check in with yourself before you open the morning newspaper or get on with the rest of your morning routine. Uh, maybe that means that on your morning commute, um, you just focus, notice your feelings, you know, just be in the present moment. Maybe you're just noticing what you see, the things around you, the trees or the snow on the trees, the sunlight coming through the trees. So it can be easy to incorporate, you know, just kind of those mindful moments into your everyday activities. Um, of course, you know, safety warning, we want you to be aware of the road too as you're driving to work, not just your feelings, but many of us can balance both. Um, so, you know, giving yourself time and space, um, recognizing when you're having um, a feeling or an experience that you need to address immediately, then we call that like halt. Um, 
when you are hungry, angry, lonely, tired, address your immediate need you know, before you move on. I mean, my family will tell you, you do not want to see hangry Nikki because um, it is, it, it isn't pretty. I'm not my best self. Give me some lunch and I can solve any problem in the world. Um, but we have to halt and take care of that need. And again, we keep saying this, you know, and not acknowledging how you're doing without judgment. All, each of us are different. We respond to um, any given situation differently. And it's, it's important to not judge ourselves or feel like we're not doing um, as well as our colleagues are holding up during this time. So just listening to our body. Those are all awareness strategies. You'll hear um, the word mindfulness associated with both kind of these awareness strategies and sometimes the strategies that help us get back into balance. And we're going to watch just a very short, cute, funny video that kind of describes mindfulness because it's a word we all hear but don't always know what it means. And okay, I'm not getting any volume on this one at all. Okay, let me, let's try one more time. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just move yeah, on. Just, yeah. <laughs> You may have heard this word mindfulness become something of a buzz phrase of late. I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've done nothing. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing? You? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you. And now all of us do it. And if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no brainers like brushing the teeth, eating well and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. <laughs> Thanks, Anna Yeah, I hope that worked. Yeah. So there are lots of um, mindfulness techniques. I need to kind of move us a little bit quicker along, so I'm not going to walk through all of these. Um, a great one is just giving yourself a moment to write in a journal. Write your emotions. Just note what you're feeling. Um, acknowledge 
the appreciation you feel for anything good, you know, happening around you. All those are mindful activities. We're going to do one together, though. Um, this is uh, a body scan activity that just lets us tune in to how we're doing, tune into our body, what we're feeling in our body, just noticing any places that we're holding tension, um, any places um, where we're feeling the stress. Um, so I want you to do this with me if you're willing. Um, and I want you to just take a moment and just settle comfortably into your chair or wherever you are. You can close your eyes or you can keep them open just a little bit, stare, softly stare down at the floor. Just lift your shoulders back, settle in. First, we're just going to start with taking kind of a, a deep breath to get focused. So we're going to breathe in slowly through our nose. One, two, three, four, five. Hold it two, three, and out slowly through your mouth. So now we're just going to kind of do a little body scan, checking in on what we notice, beginning at the very top of our body, at the top of our heads, thinking what sensations you're feeling in your face, in your eyes or jaw. Moving down to your neck and your shoulders. Just noticing any sensation. Your back. The front of your body. Just sense yourself in your chair, the weight of yourself on your chair, the chair supporting you. Feeling your legs, your thighs, your calves, all the way down to your feet. Noticing places that feel more stressed or tense or where you just feel very faint sensations. Finishing up with one more deep breath in, two, three, four, five, hold it, and out through the nose slowly. So that's a, about a one minute activity of just checking in with yourself. I want you to type in the chat if you're willing, just was there anything that you noticed that you felt relaxed or that you noticed yourself holding tension? Just drop into the chat like, yeah, I felt it in my neck or for me, I, it's my jaw. And I heard, I read an article from a dentist that said that that's become like a thing in the pandemic. Everybody has tension that they're holding in their jaw, grinding their teeth at night. Chat anything in the, or annotate anything in the chat there. Yeah, shoulders is a common one, jaw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I would agree with that too. I know my jaw is always um, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, kind of some ideas around um, building your awareness of how you're doing and when you need to up your kind of self-care game. Let's talk about balance next. The B in the ABCs. So balance is that state of steadiness and stability. Um, that sometimes can be hard to achieve. Boy, hasn't it been hard to achieve any sense of stability in the course of this pandemic? So the first thing to remember is that balance is not one size fits all. Um, Work-life balance is different for different people. Balancing the parts of ourselves looks different from different people. Um, we all need work and play, activity and rest, taking care of ourselves and meeting our obligations to others. But what that looks like is different for each of us. We also have to balance the different parts of ourselves. So our physical needs, our intellectual, mental needs, our emotional, our spiritual needs. So our brain, body, mind, and spirit all need nurturing. And sometimes one part needs more tending to than another. And our needs change over time. Uh, but it's important to check in with how we're doing, you know, in achieving balance in different areas of our lives. So remember we talked about we need balance between work and play, activity and rest, focusing on self and others, but this slide is really about kind of balancing the different parts of ourselves, parts of ourselves that we might be neglecting. Um, so of course our physical body, a lot of us, you know, sometimes tend to neglect our sleep routines. 
And, you know, when you don't sleep, nothing else in your life goes as well. So that good sleep hygiene, that getting the electronics off, um, you know, and it, setting aside, you know, a good amount of time to sleep. Um, something that can help get us to sleep is physical exercise, calms the physical body, reduces stress, whether that's taking a walk or riding a bike or getting to a, um, a yoga class. And again, just as a reminder that this is different for all of us, you know, I have a 19 year old uh, daughter who's a college student and she's training for a marathon. She just finished her first half marathon. For her, that has really been an important way to balance her schoolwork and her extracurricular activities, kind of the lots of time that she spends in the intellectual or mental side, and just the emotional you know, drama of being a college student. For me though, the idea of training for a marathon or a half marathon as a way of achieving balance is just like laughable. That is not, like that is not balance for me. Balance for me though, is walking two miles in the morning outside. Um, so again, it looks, it looks different for all of us. Emotional balance, you know, so um, how do we keep our, you know, emotions kind of uh, in a steady state? You know, how do we come down from big emotions and upset? Uh, deep breathing is one of the, you know, best ways we can do that. I have a great little video that we're probably not gonna have time for, but that you'll find on your handout. It kind of emphasizes just how young we can learn to use deep breathing to stay in emotional balance. And um, there are so many resources on the, on the internet, apps, apps like the Calm app that literally, you know, these, there are apps that you can set to remind you to just take a few minutes to breathe at different points during the day. Um, gratitude journals are awesome. So taking 30 seconds at the end of your day to just notice some things that you're thinking, thankful for. And again, you're just kind of changing the thought patterns in your brain to a little bit more of a positive thought pattern. Yoga, you know, can help. Meditation can help kind of whatever works for you. And then, you know, providing for our mental or intellectual side. So any activity that allows for creativity, learning, knowledge development, this is interesting for me as I've learned more about self-care because I never really thought about the intellectual side of self-care that like taking a class, you know, could, could be, you know, really something that is a great balance strategy for you. We're getting to return to old hobbies that we, you know, gave up, learning a new hobby, um, read a book if you like books, uh, whatever it is that will stimulate you intellectually or mentally, you know, doing that. And then our spiritual side, um, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, so engaging with your, your faith, engaging with your faith community. And then just remembering that whatever we decide for you, that you need to come into better balance, it takes routine and structure and time to incorporate that strategy into your life. Um, so planning for it, planning to do it frequently enough that it becomes kind of a habit, um, all those things are going to be important and it will take time. So just taking a moment, I want you to drop into the chat, like when you think about your barriers to self-care, what do you think about? Because it's not like any of us have never been told, you really ought to get seven or eight hours of sleep, or me and exercise would really reduce your stress. These are not new concepts to us, right? Um, so but what are some of the barriers that you face in engaging in self-care? Chad, you can just kind of read some of those out as they come in. Sure. Um, having young kids. Oh, yes. Is, is a common one that's coming through right now. Yeah. When I... Um, do training with early care and education teachers, and I ask them what they think about when they think about self-care, someone in the audience always says, eating alone in my car, because they're surrounded by young kids every day that are, that are really needy, and just having a moment alone is hard to find. Mm -hmm. else, yeah, just, and just, you know, family obligations. Um, yep. 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 It is hard. 
Um, saying no is a big challenge for many of us, but you know, again, as Emily said earlier, um, you know, we self-care is not selfish, and we have to remember that when we're saying yes to someone else, sometimes it means we're saying no to ourselves. And you know, we are not going to be any good to anyone else if we can't stay in balance um, and meet our own emotional needs so that we can meet the needs of others. So then just moving on to connection. So ABC, awareness, balance, and connection. So having people around you that you can share your ideas, thoughts, and emotions with. Those supportive relationships that are so important to healthy emotional development for kids and across all of our lifespan. We know that feeling more connected can increase our overall sense of well-being and even prolong our lives. So what, when it you know comes to self-care and connection, we know that the more connected we are um, to those that we care about and that care about us, the more in balance and better we will feel. So one of the ways that we can, um, like a key strategy for increasing feelings of connection is by planning ahead. So, you know, many of you mentioned that you have young kids. Well, one of the best things that you can do, if it's possible, is plan for a babysitter, or if you are a dog parent, you know, make those pet care plans, because I tell you, any parent will tell you, if you have a babysitter, you will not waste that time. It doesn't matter if your friend's canceled on you, or the movie you were, you know, going to, you know, isn't on anymore, you will find a way to spend that time um, doing something fun when you have a sitter. So plan ahead for it. Um, make it a priority. And of course, you know, in workplaces, we want to we want to use mentors, peer supports, buddy systems, thinking about how we can incorporate some support into our work environment. Um, again, engaging with our faith community, if that's a place that we get support, and engaging with our family, if that's where we get support. Connecting, if you're a supervisor, you know, finding routine times to connect with your staff, um, you know, identify difficulties that they may be going through. You might have been through some of the same things and can kind of help them strategize and solve problems. And then just, you know, good old having fun together. So, you know, we've been talking about uh, self-care for ourselves, but really self-care is not just you know, my job for me and your job for you. It's, if we're gonna have a healthy work environment, it's all of our jobs together. I have to help my peers, my supervisors have to help me. Um, it's, it's really about the organization. So I wanna spend just our last few minutes together talking about the ABCs as a school community. So awareness and balance and connection we've discussed about for ourselves, but what are some things we can do to embed the ABCs into our school community and help one another? So just like we have to be aware of how we're doing, um, it is, can be really helpful to just check in with our peers, our colleagues, or those that we supervise. You know, sometimes we don't check in with others. We don't ask, how are you doing when we're worried about someone because we don't know what to say or we're not, we can't fix it. We kind of know something may be going on, but we, we don't know how to fix it. And so we say nothing. But I want you to remember that what we know is that just listening, empathizing with somebody, hearing them and letting them feel heard is a powerful intervention and support. So don't hesitate to check in with your peers, you know, and say, I've noticed, you know, and I wonder if you're doing okay. This is such a stressful time for people. Really normalizing those conversations. Because again, you know, sometimes we can see in others more clearly than we can see in ourselves. <laughs> bringing balance into the workplace. We talked about bringing balance into our own lives, but we can also do this collectively. You know, workplace wellness rituals, celebrations in the workplace. Um, Bringing in opportunities to practice self-care together. Maybe someone in your workplace is great at yoga and can lead a lunchtime class. Maybe there's a walking group that does 20 minutes you know, after the school day. Um, anything that we can do to uh, bring self-care into our collective 
And then, you know, especially for supervisors, but also just as peers and colleagues, modeling good self-care for each other, modeling that it's okay to say, I'm not going to check my email on vacation. Here's who you can email instead. Or, you know, I'm not going to be checking my email after seven tonight, or I have to leave on time on Wednesdays because that's my yoga night and I, that's important for myself. So we know that good self-care rubs off on other people. We're all social learners. And so keep in mind if sometimes we feel guilty doing things for ourselves, but we're really doing it for our colleagues as well. And for you teachers out there, don't wait to do it at home. Integrate it into the classroom. Do some brief, brief stretching or muscle relaxation. You know, get on the internet and look at those breathing exercises. Get your class started by, you know, breathing at the beginning of the day or to reorient as you come back from recess or lunch. Don't wait until you get home. Help, it'll be good for the kids, it'll be good for you to bring some balancing activities into the classroom. I think we're gonna just skip this video since our videos are not working so well, but I really encourage you to check this out. So, you know, being aware of others, bringing balance, sing activities to your colleagues or to work and just being intentional about building connections at work especially in this time when um COVID has had us so isolated you know we've missed our opportunities to work in teams um, sometimes we don't have you know as many opportunities for just good positive supervision sessions staffing case conferences um all the things that help us feel supported and like a team um planning celebrations can be really important um i have a colleague at work who has a wonderful way of supporting her team and one of the things she does is is when anytime a new employee comes in they they put up a, a little bio about themselves and their favorite things on the bulletin board and when their birthday comes then they all their peers get together and put together a little bag of their favorite things their favorite candy their favorite ice cream whatever it may be and this really makes them feel special you know, and, and like a team. So um, I want to um, kind of come to the end of our time together, asking you to think about one thing you can try if you're a teacher at your classroom or school, in your workplace, whatever your workplace is, if you're not an educator, and one thing you can try at home for yourself, outside of school, or outside of your work, workplace. And if you're willing, just drop that into the chat. One thing you can try in your workplace, one thing you can try for yourself at home. Just drop that into the chat and chat will read those out to us as, as a couple of them come in. Yeah, and um, you, you can actually drop it in the, the questions part. So um, oh, thank you. I'll be happy to read those out. Uh, scheduling a, in quotes, true lunch daily. I like that, a true lunch. Yes, not the eating in front of your computer while typing at the same time and dripping soup to your keyboard. Just taking a moment to breathe. Yep, great. Just keeping your your space tidy and clean and all that all that yes. good stuff. Yep, those things make me feel good too. Well, so in your handouts that you can um, that you'll receive, um, you'll have a work a worksheet for setting a smart goal. Um, when we do these trainings in schools and we have a little bit more time, usually this is an hour and a half training that we do. We do some smart goal setting together to make sure that um, as we develop self-care plans, we're making some goals that are measurable, attainable, realistic, and I'll know when I've completed it. Um, take it going back to the example of my daughter who's training for um, a marathon, that is like a journey of many steps, pun intended. Um, but her first goal that she set for that was really just to research training schedules and get them plugged into her phone calendar by December 17th. So that was like, I know when I've done it, that's attainable and realistic. It's not going to mean she ran a marathon, but it's a great step in the right direction. And so you'll see those, um, that SMART goal worksheet with some instructions. And I really encourage you, we know that writing something down makes it more likely to happen. 
So I hope that you'll take a minute after this presentation, just think about what would be helpful to you right now, right now and write something down. Um, you'll be much more likely to walk away from this uh, hour with something meaningful if you take just a moment to do that. I'm going to stop there, but I want um, you to know that in the um, handout you'll receive, you'll get some resources, uh, more resources on self-care, resources for being able to think about um, when you might need more, resources for um, uh, mental health care if you need it through a free program um, called AR Connect. So check out those resources as you have time um, and take a step to take care of yourself and your colleagues. Thank you, Nikki um, and Emily. That was a really wonderful presentation on self-care. I know you couldn't quite get to everything you would, would like to. As a reminder for all of you educators, we do offer this as a training through TRIS. So if you go to um, www.tris-ar.org, which is, will also be on your handout, uh, that's a place where you could learn more about what TRIS offers, including trainings on some more in-depth uh, on self-care. So um, just real quick, um, I wanted you all to know that in order to get your CEU credit, if you need that, you will be emailed a, a poll that you will reply to, and you will use this code, 2101. Um, and if you put that code into the, the poll that you will receive by email, you will get a CEU emailed to you. So that should be all good to go. You'll also be getting those handouts that we mentioned. And we hope that that's helpful for you on your self-care journey. Uh, thank you all again for joining us today. And we hope you have a, a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend.